everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Do you have so much stuff that you fantasized about renting a giant dumpster and tossing everything in it just so you can move on with your life? Well, we don't recommend the dumpster method because there are better ways to sell, donate, or recycle most things but it sure would feel freeing, wouldn't it, to start over with a clean slate? That's what we're talking about today on The Minimalist Podcast. What possessions are you struggling to let go of? What items or rooms are weighing you down? What would you feel like if you could just let go? Then this Thursday on The Minimalist Private Podcast, Ryan and I are going to talk about letting go season. We'll also debate a dozen rules for simple living from other minimalists. Are they helpful, harmful, or just a waste of time? You can check that out at patreon.com slash The Minimalist. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free because advertisements suck. Now, if you're watching the video version of the podcast right now, you might notice something a little bit different about our setup today. Josh, behind you! Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! Oh my god, he's finally doing you in! It's Jordan the Jedi! <laughs> uh, are you the first ever Native American Jedi, Jordan? Oh yeah. <laughs> Well, now you'll notice something a bit different here. We're in a black box space. You're on the wide shot right now, Danny. Jordan, thank you for the theatrics. It was perfect. Yes. He had a giant uh, lightsaber behind me. If you're just listening to the audio version of the podcast, which is fine. But you'll notice that we're in this new space. And I want to talk about that real quick because today we're really talking about starting over in various ways. We all would feel free from a clean slate. What do we have today behind us? Literally a clean slate. Yeah. Uh, big thanks to a few people for making this happen. First off, um, we've been in this new studio space for almost a year now, and uh, we just changed it after the first year. Beulah perfected the studio space. Yes. And uh, then it was time for a change. Yeah. One of my favorite things is once we've built something is to sort of... Uh, well, tear it down tear it and down. start over. How can you tear something down if you don't build it first? <laughs> That's what I want to know. That's right. No, I think it's a good uh, it's a good lesson in, um, I don't know, like something adds value one day and then the next day it doesn't. Mm. And instead of clinging to it, you can kind of let it go. I mean, those paintings were beautiful. Um, it looked really good. Mm -hmm. uh, it was it looked like an art studio, which was yes. the whole the whole purpose. Um, but yeah, they, it wasn't kind of doing what we thought it would do. So we had to like, let go of those paintings and that's, it wasn't easy. Like those are great paintings. Those are gorgeous paintings. Yeah. Um, but yeah, man, here we are. We let it go. Here's we what stopped I've, clinging. That's exactly what I want to talk to you about today is the, the clinging, right? Mm. Uh, before we do talk about that though, you bring up a great point, Ryan, is sometimes the vision you have in your mind doesn't comport with reality. So we created this beautiful art gallery it didn't translate as well on camera. And so you and I sat down and we were talking about this and we realized like, oh, wait a minute. Every time we go to a TV set, say we go to the Today Show or Good Morning America or CBS this morning, it looks great on camera. Yeah. But as soon as you step back from the camera, you're like, well, wait a minute. Yeah. You're like, how is this going to look good on TV? Right. I, I've come across that so many times. Yeah. Because it seems like the lights are too bright and they're in the wrong positions. And then, yeah, you just have like a little set... Um, and then, yeah, you see it on TV and you're like, oh, yeah, that's the TV magic. And so the pain is it made this space really beautiful to come work in and spend time in. Mm -hmm. It didn't translate as well on camera. In fact, I bought one of the paintings from mm -hmm. Beulah uh, about a month ago, and she's going to be selling the rest of the paintings that were in this room as well. Mm -hmm. You can check that out at, I think we put it at the minimalists.com slash art. And that just forwards to her website because I couldn't remember all of the hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. And so the minimalists.com slash art, if you want to check out any of those paintings, it's just uh, while they're there, they're there. Your life is complete without them. But if you'd like a little artwork on your walls, then you can definitely check that out. But I want to say thanks to Beulah for that first iteration of the studio. The other back half of the studio here is still exactly as she designed it. We just put up a studio tour over on mm. Patreon, the fifth and final installment of that studio space mm. before we blew everything up. Studio tour season one. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. I, Stay tuned for season two. <laughs> season uh, two, or yeah, what is it? Uh, yeah. Season two, season two has been confirmed. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> We've been renewed. We've for, been re- Yes, that's what the word I was looking for. Yeah. Malabama, I want to thank you too, because she was sort Aww. of the project manager on this space while we were gone. <laughs> Uh, we were out on tour. We finished up tour at uh, the American leg of the Love People Use Things tour. Mm. We were in Chicago and Minneapolis, and we had Oscar come in here and do like three coats of matte black, no VOC paint uh, to make it look beautiful. And now from here, with this clean slate, we will slowly iterate. We'll make mm. some changes. We'll add some backlighting. We'll add green screens and roller coasters. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we'll we'll slowly repopulate the space to make it our aesthetic. And what I really like about this is the fact that we we actually have come full circle in a way. Jordan and I were meeting here yesterday. He goes, "This is how we wanted the last studio space to look mm. on camera. Mm. We just didn't have the depth, the space, the equipment to make that happen. Yeah. We were in a closet, basically. Pretty much. In our last studio. Yeah. And now we have the space to make it beautiful. So stay tuned to that. You can find it on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash The Minimalists. Or if you just want full episodes of the podcast, it's youtube.com slash The Minimalists Podcast. We have to YouTube channels because we're minimalists. That's right. <laughs> I say we dive into some questions today. Malabama, we got a question here from Peg on Facebook. I am a neat freak and a minimalist, but my husband is not and drives me crazy. His nightstand, dresser, drawers, and bathroom sink are piled with rarely used things to the point where I just want to throw all of his stuff into a dumpster. Help. Hmm. Well, don't throw your husband's things into a dumpster. That's theft. That's step one. <laughs> Wait a minute. <laughs> oh man. Well, it's funny because this is a th- this is bothering Peg. It's not bothering her husband. And it's often that we project our own judgments and frustrations onto someone else. Now, I'm not saying that there isn't some work that her husband needs to do. Maybe there's a you know, maybe there's an unhealthy situation. If that's the case, then yes, like you've got to, you've got to approach your husband about it. But dude, the minute we come out with the, here's how you make your partner a minimalist, we will be, uh, yeah, we will sell 3 million copies just like Marie Kondo. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, the thing about that is what you're talking about is how do I get this person to change their worldview, right? Mm -hmm. And What you're really saying is, how do I get them outside of their comfort zone? The comfort zone that we have is a killer, right? And Ryan is right that these things aren't bothering him, at least consciously. They may be bothering him subconsciously. Mm -hmm. Sounds like your husband is at least a uh, level one hoarder, maybe even a level two hoarder. Mm -hmm. Ryan and I even had some level three hoarding tendencies Mm -hmm. back in our um, consumerist days. Mm -hmm. A level one hoarder, you know what a level one hoarder means? You have light clutter in more than one room. Yeah. Yeah. And no noticeable odors. Yeah. That those are like the 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 key signs. No noticeable odors. Uh-huh. A so light clutter in, in every room. Yeah, in, in more than one room. More than one room. And ah. so clearly he's a level one whore. That's not a judgment, right? Mm-hmm. It's just understanding that most of us we tend to hoard. We tend to cling. And you mentioned this earlier about the desire to cling. And mm-hmm. and there are really three reasons that we cling to anything. The first reason is we want approval from mm-hmm. someone or validation or veneration. I need someone to look favorably on me. Mm-hmm. The other way that we look at that is we mistake it for love. I want to be loved. Mm-hmm. And this often goes back to childhood trauma in our lives, right? Mm-hmm. And so instead of pointing and saying, oh, my husband needs to change these things, let's talk about why he may be clinging to some things that aren't adding value to his life. Mm-hmm. Because you could tell him, So you're blue in the face. You should do this. You should do that. Here are the benefits I'm getting. Mm -hmm. But that's almost like talking to him about, oh, we're getting ready to go on tour uh, in Canada. We have two tour stops, Toronto and Vancouver coming Mm -hmm. up. Now imagine, Ryan, if we landed in Vancouver Mm -hmm. and I handed you a map of Toronto Mm -hmm. and said, here you go, (laughs) navigate the streets. Yeah. Right. And Mm -hmm. that's kind of what you're doing here is you're handing him, you'd be handing him your map peg. Yeah. Here's the benefits I get, but he may not experience those same benefits. Mm -hmm. He needs a map of Vancouver, not of Toronto. What am I meaning there? What I mean is he needs to understand what the benefits are for him. It's why we started our last film with that question. 
how might your life be better with less? Not how your life will, and his life will both be better with less. <laughs> how will his life be better with less? Yeah. Helping him understand that because fundamentally, we cling to things for three reasons. One is approval. I just talked about that. We feel like we have lost out on love somewhere along the way. Two is control. Mm -hmm. This was my big one, especially as a kid, because my world was so chaotic and it's still a big one for me right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's part of my program, part of my childhood trauma. Because the world was so chaotic, I clung to the few things that I had because I needed that sense of control. I need to have control over something. Yeah. It's also the reason I overate and I was morbidly obese as a kid. Mm. I could control the calories I was putting in my body. I could control the gustatory mm. pleasure in this moment. And third and finally, safety or security. That's why we cling. We mm. think that I'm going to be safe if I have all the right things. The control thing is fascinating because uh, we... The more we seek control, the less, the more things get out of control mm -hmm. because you can control all these different variables. Yeah. And then you realize like, oh, now I feel like I need more control. I, I witnessed this recently, Ryan. I'm in the process of moving right now. Bex and I just bought a house and we'll talk about that in a future episode. We're going to do a, a home ownership versus renting episode in the future. Mm -hmm. But I'm great with chaos outside the home. Mm -hmm. I, I'm able to function really well with chaos everywhere. But in the home, it is crippling for me. Yeah, it's that control thing, man. And it goes back to that childhood trauma, right? Yeah, yeah. Oh, if things are out of control, I need to be able to control something. Right. But of course, if I get everything in order and have all the right knickknacks and all the things in place, and I have everything under control, has it really changed anything? Has mm. it made me more complete? Mm. No, the default setting in our lives is enough. The problem is we're constantly seeking enough outside. It's like trying to count to infinity. Mm. You can try to count to infinity. It's like trying to get enough. Yeah. Infinity's already there. You can't count to it. Enough is already there. You can't get to it. Mm. And so if you're starting with that state, if your husband, Peg, if he understood that he already has enough, then any of the things that he brings into his life, it's fine. Nothing wrong with stuff. Peg, you have some stuff. In fact, you might even have some stuff. He's like, I can't believe she has that thing. Yeah. And that's okay. But we can bring those things in and we can hold on to them as they're useful mm -hmm. without clinging to them long term. Yeah. So I'm thinking about reasons why we cling. So there's just in case stuff, which would be that would fall into the category of uh, safety. And, mm -hmm. you know, having something just in case. Sentimentality. Does that go back to the first one? Uh, so sentimentality is validation, love. Yeah. I, I think that's part of it. I think it depends on the person. Yeah. So we all, every human being has all three of those. Approval. Mm -hmm. We all need approval. Sure. We all need to control to yes. some extent. Yeah. And we all like need to we feel do. safety, right? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah we, we think that we need these things, right? And right. it manifests in different ways. Even the Hadza, they need to have control of their environment to make sure they're not being eaten by a, a predator or something, right? Mm -hmm. And safety, et cetera. Mm -hmm. In fact, Safety tends to govern those other two. Um, mm. When we when we you really look at the default there. Anyway, when I when I think about the just in case item, yes, most of the time that is well, I feel as though things are scarce. Yeah, and because things are scarce, I need to control scarce. I don't have the abundance mindset. I have a scarcity mindset. Right, and so I need to cling to these things to provide me safety mm -hmm. or the another word for safety is what comfort yeah and as we get bogged down in our comfort zone now anyone listening to this has probably had this experience mm -hmm. especially if you share our podcast with other people that's our most popular way that we reach other people certainly not through advertisements obviously mm. People share it with their mother, their brother, their sister, or whomever. Now, you might have heard our podcast, and you dove deep, and you listened to half a dozen episodes, and you're like, oh, my God, these guys, they're on to something. Mm -hmm. This whole minimalism thing, it makes a lot of sense to me. And then you share it with your, with your mom or your daughter or your cousin, and they're like, eh, that's fine. I don't really see what you see in there. Now, why don't they see what you saw? is because you were willing to make yourself uncomfortable mm. in the moment. You're willing to get out of that safety and, and expand that comfort zone. But most people are perfectly content within their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And you can't ask them to, you can't drag them out of their comfort zone. That creates suffering that they mm. didn't ask for, right? Yeah. But 
if they start to see the benefits, how might your life be better with less? How might your husband's life be better with less? Because my guess is there's some sort of childhood trauma or life trauma in general that has caused them to continue to cling. And with that clinging, you get dragged and he's being dragged in a direction. Now that might be subconscious. It may not be like, oh, I realize I'm being dragged. I need to let go of this. No, it's just suffering. Yeah. And we hold on Mm. until we realize that we can let go. Yeah. You know, Peg's question, uh, it's very similar to some of the questions we have today, some of the questions we've got in the past. And really it's about how to have a better relationship with someone who doesn't have the same thoughts about minimalism as you do. And, you know, I think that, and I know I was guilty of this, having this idea of finding like the perfect partner, the soulmate, someone who completes me, someone who, you know, is just this, this perfect, um, perfect partner. But the problem is that there's no such thing as perfect. There's no such thing as, uh, you know, someone completing you. So, you know, when, when I hear questions like this, it's like, yes, I do want to, I do want to make an observation about how maybe, you know, the situation can be approached a little bit differently to help ease some tensions or, you know, uh, cut out a little bit of anxiety or whatever it is. But really, you know, what I want people to understand is like, it's not a question of how can you make this person fit into your life exactly the way you want them to. That is a poor quality question. You're never going to get there. So the, the real question is, is how can you work with someone towards something that both of you can agree upon? Uh, that, that path, that path is the, that's, that's in my opinion, that's the true path. Yeah. And what I'll say is that we imperfect ourselves by trying to find perfect external, externally, mm. right? Yeah. It's like, I'll just heap these things onto me and they will make me perfect. Mm-hmm. Not realizing like, well, I know I'm already enough and to me, enough is a type of perfect in a way. Mm. And then those things, there's nothing wrong with playing the game. If you want to buy a thing because it's going to make your life easier, you know, having the app on your phone with the the music, whatever, instead of buying CDs, like, okay, that, that makes a whole lot of sense for me, right? Mm-hmm. But it doesn't make me better. It doesn't right. improve who I am inside. Mm. And I love what you're saying about the better quality question there, Ryan, because instead of saying, how do I get my husband to understand that he's suffering? Because mm-hmm. you can't, there's no how to understand. Right. You only set up the environment for understanding. Mm-hmm. That's how we learn through immersion. And so the better question is, why is he clinging to these things? Mm-hmm. And it goes back to those three areas. Either he feels like he doesn't have approval, maybe that's from you or from his parents or so, from society, or he feels like he doesn't have control and this is a way for him to regain control, Mm -hmm. at least theoretically. Mm -hmm. Of course, that never works. It never gives us actual control. Mm -hmm. The the best way to get control, to gain control, is to let go of needing control. And then finally, if he feels unsafe, I doubt that's where he is, so it's probably one of the first two. It's either approval or the need for control. So get to the why, then you can help him better understand, not through a how-to, but setting up the environment for understanding. Let's move on to our callers. If you have a question or comment for our podcast, give us a call 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. It looks like we have a question here today from Mara in Toronto. Over the years, I've received plaques, weird shaped glass awards with my name on it, big picture frames that you can't really reuse because it says stuff like awards conference 2010. It's kind of random things you get at conferences and banquets. Although I'm really happy to have the memories of the award or whatever the situation was, the physical mementos have no meaning in my life. And I can't think of how to repurpose them. And I can't stand thinking about them sitting in a landfill forever if I throw them away. So I'm just curious what you guys would do with them. What do you do with all your awards, Josh? All the awards I give you for best friend. <laughs> <laughs> runner up. Here's the uh, here's the plaque for runner up best friend. Oh, no. <laughs> you know, it's fascinating because I have two answers for this, Ryan. One is what I did with mine, mm-hmm. which was rather symbolic, and I wouldn't recommend it. That's why we're calling this this episode the dumpster method, because right. it's not about throwing things out. I, if I could le- go back and learn from my mistakes of decluttering, I threw too many things out up front mm-hmm. without trying 
trying to repurpose them in mm. a way that would be useful for other people. Now, symbolically, it was awesome mm -hmm. because I just literally took a trash can and took, I mean, I had these heavy, really nice President's oh, Club yeah, awards. Oh, yeah, man. They were like glass and like, yeah, a lot of weight to them for sure. You had the same ones, right? Yeah. Yeah, man. And yeah. I, yeah. I, uh, yeah, I got, I tossed mine because hindsight, I would have donated them because I know there's like, you know, some eclectic person out there that would like, because the awards were beautiful. I mean, you know, they could have been like an art piece, you know, or a weapon. They were heavy or a weapon. Yeah. So I know that like, you know, they probably would have eventually have gotten tossed, but at least the opportunity like to be put out there for someone to grab and, you know, some hipster out there who's like, Oh, I got the number one president. I have no idea what this means, but I have number one president's club award. And uh, yeah, I mean the landfill thing, the thing I always say is as soon as you purchase an item, as soon as you brought an item into your house, it's you've already done the damage to the environment. So, you know, she says she doesn't, she can't picture the, the awards sitting there in a landfill forever. Um, but she also can't picture them sitting on her shelf forever. And at least in the landfill, they will decompose a little faster than the decomposition that'll happen on your shelf. Um, but yeah, I say, I say donate them, man. That's what I, if I could go back, that's what I would have done. I would have well, donated them. I, in fact, I've got some instructions on how you can donate them. And so we'll get real practical on this because I think this is a practical one. And you can learn from my mistake because I don't regret what I did. But if I go back and change it, I did regret it for a while, but I learned the lesson. As soon as you learn the lesson, you let go of the regret. Yes. Right. And so we talked about that on our consumer regrets episode mm -hmm. a few weeks back. And there were two things that I wanted to note here, Ryan. One is I looked up like ar artistic things you can do with your old awards and trophies. Mm. And I found this Pinterest board with like 141 ideas for your old trophies. And they all looked aesthetically horrible. Oh, my they goodness. They were awful. <laughs> they were hideous. There's 141 bad ideas on what to do with your trophies. People were using them as coat hangers and like, like you know what? For some people, mm. that kitschiness works well. And so when I say they're horrible, I'm just projecting my own aesthetic yes. sensibilities, preferences, sure. desires. Yeah. But for, I might actually see it in someone else's house. It, it would look so out of place in my house. But I might see it in someone else's house and say, that's really cool that you did that. Yeah. And that you turned your old President's Club awards into coat hangers mm -hmm. or into, I mean, they had all kinds of ideas. In fact, Sean, if you can find that Pinterest board, put it in the show notes, please. <laughs> but then let's get real practical here, right? Mm -hmm. Right. Since she said she has awards, plaques. Think about plaque for a second. Mm -hmm. We go to the dentist to get rid of plaque. <laughs> <laughs> Is that what they're taking off? <laughs> and and yet in our homes we cling to the plaque. Mm, what a metaphor. Yeah. But if you're if you really want to let go of these things because they're no longer adding value to your life, you can take pictures of them obviously and uh, that way you still have the memory trigger in your home. But this is an article Ryan from Recycle Bank. We'll put a link to this in the show notes as well. It's called What can I do with old trophies and medals? Old trophies and medals are often made from recyclable materials, but they also hold value in their current form, and many can be reused. A number of companies have programs dedicated specifically to the art of refurbishing trophies. The best known of these include Total Awards and Promotions, and there's a link in the article to that place. They're in Madison, Wisconsin, and Lamb Awards and Engraving in Westminster, Maryland. These programs break unwanted awards down for parts. Mm. It's like if you steal a car and then you're like, you, you sell it for parts. We're in the wrong business. <laughs> we can <could> steal trophies. <laughs> That's right. Actually, that I think you have to pay to, to, for them to do this, but uh, uh, I think it's like a dollar or something. Anyway, let me, let me just go to the rest of the article and then we could talk about it here. Rebuilding new trophies and plaques with whichever parts are usable and recycling the rest. So they recycle it for you so you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to put it in landfill. They'll reuse or recycle these for you. The rebuilt items are then donated to nonprofit organizations or resold. Both programs will allow you to ship trophies that are in sufficiently good condition for nominal processing and shipping fees. Please note their restrictions. While medals are accepted by these groups, there are also options dedicated specifically to giving medals a new life. 
Sports Metal Recycling, there's a link in here as well, a Massachusetts-based organization, contributes the proceeds from recycling donated metals to fundraising for charity runs. The metals are removed from their ribbons and sorted for scrap recycling, while the ribbons are sent to cloth slash textile recycling. Sports Metal Recycling even makes sure that all the packing materials you use to send them the goods are recycled as well, from bubble wrap to cardboard boxes. So you get the point. You can read the rest of the article there, but it shows you that there are actually some places. The article goes on to say, if you feel bad about like shipping off your old trophies or maybe you just can't afford it, then you can check with your local. There there are always going to be local trophy shops around you within a certain radius. And many of them accept donations as well because they can reuse your trophy. Sometimes it's just about putting a new little nameplate on the trophy. So if you don't want to ship it off to one of these places in Wisconsin or Maryland, you can obviously just go to your local trophy shop and ask them. Also, I do know that Goodwill will take a lot of different trophies and awards as well. So you have options. You don't have to cling to them. You don't have to throw them out. Yeah. Yeah. I love that idea. That's that's amazing. Mara, I'd love to see you in a few months. Ryan and I are going to be in Toronto. We'll give you a couple tickets to the Love People Use Things tour stop in Toronto. We'll also be in Vancouver. Both of those are in October. Theminimalists.com slash tour for tickets. We're going to give a live talk about minimalism, a book reading from our book, Love People Use Things, and we'll do a live version of The Minimalist Podcast. This week on the Maxwell episode, Ryan, I want to talk to you about some of your favorite moments since we just finished the American leg of the tour, 18 cities down. I realized something. This is our 10th tour in 12 years. Ironically, this is actually our longest tour mm. because we had to postpone some dates because of the weather and yeah. travel restrictions and, and COVID, et cetera. But we had to postpone some things. So even though it's only a 20 city tour, it ended up being like 13 months long. Oh my goodness. Was it really that long? Yeah, because we started in September of last year in Texas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then October will be the end of the Love People Use Things tour. Oh, but yeah. on, on the yeah. Maximal this week, I want to talk to you about some of your favorite moments because I'll tell you this. We had some of my favorite events that we've ever had. Yeah, likewise. Chicago, New York. Yeah. Oh, there's Anyway, we'll get into that on... Denver, Denver was awesome. Oh my God. And Denver was like, it was in a comedy club. It felt like a comedy show. Yeah, it was good. If you miss any of those events, you can check them out on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash The Minimalist. We release one of those a month once we get home and Jordan and Podcast Sean, they, um, they start to edit those together, make it look beautiful for our lovely patrons. Also this week on Patreon, I want to share something um, about dumpsters, about the dumpster method. We have a story from Love People Use Things that I read while we're on the road. And I'm not going to share it publicly just yet, but we'll share it on the private podcast. Ryan, what time is it? You know what time it is. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your co- comments, your questions, your smart remarks, your eggplant emojis. You can send all those to 937-202-4654. Now, those texts actually do go to both of our phones. We respond to as many people as we can. But we also answer some questions here on the podcast. During the lightning round, this is where Ryan and I do our best to answer these questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. Oh, by the way, if you're on, if you send us a text, you'd be, you, you're entered into our Monday morning minimal maxims. We never send you spam or junk or advertisements, obviously, but every Monday we start your week off with a little bit of simplicity, a Monday morning minimal maxim to start your week out simply. We have a question here today from Amy. I've been reselling items as a way to pay down debt, but now my kids are getting attached and it's starting to pile up. How do I keep them from clinging to my inventory? Well, well, Ryan, we talked about clinging a bit. Yeah. And I've got some difficult truths for Amy here. Hmm. There's a reason they're clinging. We talked about the three reasons that someone might cling to something. Maybe they don't feel loved, meaning they they don't feel validated or Mm -hmm. they don't have enough approval. At least Mm -hmm. that's their perception, right? Yeah. The reason I clung to a lot of things as a kid Mm -hmm. was control. I felt like I didn't have control of the chaotic world around me. Yes. And so I held on to things that weren't serving me anymore. Mm -hmm. Or maybe they feel unsafe Mm. for some reason. Mm. And so instead of asking, how do I get my kids to let go or not want these things? Ask them, why are they clinging to 
this inventory, yeah. right? Because you see it as inventory, and it's easy to let go of inventory, right? Yeah. Because letting go is not something you do. It's something you stop doing. You stop clinging to the excess. But with your kids, it's not excess. It's not inventory. It's precious to them. Well, why is it precious? Why do they cling? Because they either feel unloved in some way, and so they're they're getting certainty that way. They're getting through approval. Mm-hmm. Or maybe they feel like, Things are out of control in their house or at school or in their neighborhood. They feel unsafe maybe, Mm. right? And so what is underlying this clinging? As soon as you understand that, then you can set up the environment for your kids so they don't feel the need to cling. Right now, they feel like they are not enough. And if you feel like you're not enough, then no external thing will ever make you feel complete. However, if you've created an environment where there's abundance there, because we cling only if we fail to realize the abundance of our everyday lives. Oh, you could tweet that podcast, Sean. So abundance is the default state. We unfortunately, through our culture, through media, through advertisements, maybe your kids are just watching a lot of YouTube ads and that's what's making them feel incomplete. That's what's making them want to cling. Right. Mm. And the more we try, by the way, the harder we fail. Uh, Another tweet for you, podcast, Sean. That's something pithy. Um, Because as we try, 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 think about this, Ryan. You've uh, you've had trouble with sleep in the past, getting to sleep specifically. Yeah. And what happens when you are when you're in that state and you try harder to go to sleep? You just. You just don't go to sleep even faster. <laughs> <laughs> thus, thus, the harder you try, the harder you fail, right? Exactly. And, and yet, when you stop trying, when you're able to just go to sleep, there's no trying to go to sleep. Mm-hmm. I also think about your cat, who is a total scaredy cat. Yeah. I remember the first time I met your cat, mm-hmm. I tried to pet him. Yeah. And what happened? Yeah, he runs off. Yes. Mm-hmm. The only time I've ever pet your cat is when I wasn't trying yep. to pet your cat. I set up the environment where I felt he felt secure. Yep. He felt approved or loved. Yeah. He felt like he was in control. Mm-hmm. And then he came over to me and allowed me to pet him for about three seconds. Right. But if I would have tried, I would have continued to fail. Instead, it was about setting up that, that state of abundance, that state of enough, mm. and then letting things happen from there. Yeah. Totally agree, man. Um, the thing I would tell Mara is, I'm sorry, Amy, the thing I would tell Amy is this, kids do what we do, not what we say. So Amy, your kids and any kids out there, the way they are, they're learning all that behavior from somewhere. And this isn't a judgment. This isn't, uh, it's not a bad thing. It's not a good thing. It's just an observation. And for your kids to cling the way that they are, they're learning that from somewhere And if it was from you, that's okay. It's not a big deal at all. Now you're starting to let go and that's great. But, you know, even though it took you overnight to just start letting things go, it's not going to happen that way with your kids. It's not going to happen overnight. So the best thing you can do is really lead by example and help them understand the why. And then whatever they do from there is, you know, that's, that's on them. Um, Yeah, it's, it's, it's okay if they're not exactly how you want them to be. Um, but you can certainly help them get closer by understanding and by setting an example. That's great because when you think about that, yeah, it seems like to to Amy that it probably happened overnight, but maybe it took you 30 years to finally start letting go, right? Mm-hmm. You were breathing that air of clinging, so to speak, mm-hmm. for 30 years. How long have your kids been breathing that same air that you were breathing, mm-hmm. that you were displaying to them, that air that you were exhaling into the environment? Mm-hmm. Of course, it was a m- much more about what you've done in front of them, the things that you were clinging to. Mm-hmm. Now, if they saw you clinging for their entire lives, let's say my, my daughter's nine. If she saw me clinging for her entire nine years on this earth, then of course she's going to cling mm-hmm. because she sees that's what you're supposed to do. The example that's set forth for me has been clinging up to this point. Mm-hmm. You're putting new air in the room, but it's hard for them to breathe that air because they haven't been exposed to it until now. Mm. We'll get to our right here, right now segment in a moment. But first, Malabama, 
You got something for us? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Hey there. I am just listening to some of your older podcasts, and I came across one where a caller was wondering about letting go of baby clothes. One of the things that I've put in place, one of the rules that I've made for myself is that in order for me to hold on to things from my daughter's childhood, which I'm a person who is nostalgic, I like to hold on to things. Um, I still have the flower dress that my grandma made for me when I was in my aunt's wedding. And this rule kind of goes along with that as well. But I like to have a picture, a good picture of the item that kind of gives a snapshot in time instead of just having an item in a box. There needs to be a good picture to go along with it, to give it some context, to age the item, and just to give it a little bit more meaning. So, for example, I've held on to just a couple of my daughter's outfits from when she was really little, and I have really good photos of her in those outfits. And I just feel like it gives it a lot more meaning than having a pile of clothes that really have no relation to her um, to actually have a photo to go along with the cute little outfit. Um, It just kind of sparks those memories a little bit more. The same thing with her artwork. When she was little, I saved all of her artwork and it piles up after a while. It's really fun when they're really little, but as they get older, you realize that you have tons and tons of this artwork And I started scanning things. I would date them and things so that I would have an idea of when they came from. But once they pile up, you really lose track of when they made those items, how old they were, what school were they in. And they lose their their real sentimental value if they don't have a story to go along with them. So um, her daycare used to send pictures of them making their artwork. And so I've held on to just a few pieces that I have really good photos of her actually making the item. Um, so that, you know, in the future, her and I can pull those out and look at the picture and be like, oh, you know, do you remember this when you were making this and look at the item at that time, um, and just keep a few things instead of keeping everything. And then I scan everything else sooner or later, I'll put it together into a photo book or maybe I won't, but at least I have a scan of it. If I ever want to take a look back or if she wants to look back and try and remember some of the things that she made. Hi, Josh and Ryan. My name is Alana from Rochester, New York. I'm just calling in to share with the world that I've been becoming more sustainable and trying to use less physical items, things that are wrapped in plastic, things that are store-bought or brand new. I found this really great website called Marley's Monsters. It's a small family-run business that's in Oregon, and you can order all sorts of awesome, sustainable goods from her website. I just ordered cloth paper towels that are reusable, washable sponges, some hair scrunchies, some reusable straws. So there's some really great items if people want to check that out and be more eco-friendly. All right, y'all, for our right here, right now segment, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. I forget to mention this, so I just wanted to mention it this time because we create so much over on the private podcast. So Mm -hmm. basically every week, every Tuesday, we do the free version of the podcast, completely advertisement free, but that is supported by our Patreon supporters. But that's not just a bonus content club. It's Mm -hmm. We do a private podcast, a long form podcast. Mm -hmm. We let our hair down, we roll our sleeves up and other mixed metaphors. Mm -hmm. But it's really a place where we um, we test out things things that we wouldn't necessarily talk about in public. If you sign up for, uh, you can do it just month month to month, or if you sign up for a year, you get over one month for free uh, over there, patreon.com slash the minimalist. So if you know you want to support the show, that's a a great way to do it. In fact, I got a a thoughtful testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon supporters here. Inasha says, I'm so delighted to have joined the private podcast. I discovered the minimalist via the Trojan horse route. I just wanted to declutter. Now, for those of you who don't know what she's saying here, um, Ryan and I will often say minimalism is a Trojan horse for us to talk about so many other things. Yeah. We, uh, we sneak in the door by talking about decluttering or letting go of material possessions. But then when you start dealing with that excess clutter physically, you start looking internally. Maybe there's internal clutter, mental clutter, spiritual clutter, financial clutter, calendar clutter, relationship clutter. We talk about all of these things over on the private podcast. She says, I listen to the free podcast to inspire me during the tedious journey of minimizing, but the philosophy and the insights 
from an uncluttered mind just had me hooked. I have had so much value and inspiration that it was a no-brainer to become a Patreon subscriber and learn even more. I love how the private podcast has completely changed the way I think. Wow. That's beautiful. You're welcome to join us over there if you'd like. Every Thursday, we put out a long-form maximal episode completely separate from our minimal episode. It tends to complement the minimal, but different questions, different podcasts, different conversations, different articles. We dive deep. For our added value segment this week, Ryan, um, I've been listening. I've been uh, trying to be more calm with this move that we have going on. We're mm-hmm. decluttering during our move as well. Mm-hmm. I, as a minimalist, I've, I don't barely own anything, but sometimes I feel like everything's out of control. <laughs> and so uh, one way that I set an environment for understanding, for healing, for calm is through music. And there's this album by Whatever the Weather. And the whole album, every song title, we're going to listen to a little snippet here. In fact, you can start playing it now, podcast, Sean. This song is called 25 Degrees Celsius. <laughs> Every song has a different temperature. That's great. And they're, pro- they're probably trying to, um, yeah, to, to, to mimic what that temperature feels like to them. Mm-hmm. I thought about this when I, was a, when I was a kid. I thought it would be cool to have a band called Speed Limit. And there would be different speed limits. Oh, that's great. And it was the tempo of the song. <laughs> this, is, this is very similar. This is very similar. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I struggle doing the conversion. So what it's... Uh, so Celsius to Fahrenheit is... Well, it's just... It's 25 times 2, which is 50. And then you remove the 0, which is 5. And then you add 32, which is 82. And then that 5, you subtract it, which would be 75 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> that's Simple. good. Yeah. <laughs> the way I've always done it is you took... You take 25, mm-hmm. multiply it by 9 fifths... <laughs> <laughs> and then you add 32. <laughs> oh, it's the same exact thing. Pretty it much. is the same yeah, thing. Yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. So it's somewhere around 75. Somewhere I guess. Or 75 degrees. Yeah. Anyway, enjoy this from whatever the wet weather. It's just calm music. Most of it's instrumental, not all of it. There's some mm-hmm. vocals throughout the album. The album is also called Whatever the Weather mm-hmm. because I feel like I want some calm music sometimes to declutter because you can declutter no matter the weather. weather. And it's 77 degrees. I just realized I did the math wrong. <laughs> <laughs> well, by the way, Ryan, we have a bunch more surprise questions this week. Like, I feel stressed after letting go of too much stuff at once. How do you handle the aftershocks of purging? What a great question. The hardest thing for me is parting with my children's baby things. Why are baby blankets and favorite toys so hard to let go of? I am the repository for dead people's things. <laughs> I have items from my parents and both sets of grandparents that hold so much sentimental value to me, but they also clutter my home. I want to let go, but where's the best place to start? Is it with my own stuff or is it with someone else's stuff? <laughs> Plus, a million more questions for The Minimalist. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist private podcast. Visit patreon.com slash The Minimalist to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain immediate access to hundreds of hours of private archives, recordings of live events, exclusive home tours, and our private community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at The Minimalist. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, just sign up for our free email list over at theminimalists.com. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Malabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, Danny Unknown, Post Production Peter, Emma the Immigrant, and the rest of our team, I'm Joshua Fields Milburn. If you leave here today with just one message, let it be this love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for listening, y'all. We'll see you next time. Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing you think that you need Every little thing that's just feeding your greed Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it